Hi, everyone. So we shouldn't keep everyone waiting. Thank you so much for coming in on time. A very good afternoon to all of you. I am Vera from UOB SMU Asian Enterprise Institute. Uh, we are a unit within the Singapore Management University. Together with our partner, the Sustainability and Entrepreneurship Centre from Sassin School of Management, welcome back to this second part of the SMU Sassin Sustainability Webinar Series for Asian family businesses. Today, our speakers are going to share with you much insights relating to how you can ensure sustainability of your family business with the right set of family charter and family business box. Okay, so before we begin, um, please kindly note the following because we are doing a recording of today's webinar. So here are some of the information which we would like to inform you. All right, let me move on. Now, you are looking at the quick view of today's lineup, uh, program lineup for today. Kickstarting today's session will be Professor Mandy, who is the Assistant Professor of Finance, Education Track, and Academic Director of the Master of Science in Wealth Management program at Singapore Management University. Prof. Mandy will be sharing on the Family Charter and Family Supervisory Board which are the key cogs in the overall family governance structure and how these could possibly sustain family businesses through generations by building trust and, of course, communication. So please stay tuned. Prof. Mandy is coming up very, very soon. And for the second part of the webinar, we have invited uh, Poon Chanokpon Sila Nanon, the Associate Director at MCC for them for Accessories, to join Prof. Mandy in a robust sharing. So Kun Biu, whom, she, uh, whom we affectionately call her, she will be joining us to do sharing from her perspective as a associate director, as a business leader, and how they are actually looking at things in its own rights pertaining to this particular subject. And the session will be moderated by our dear partner, Alex, who is the senior advisor at Sassin SEC. Okay, so now, first up, let us now invite Professor Mandy to kickstart today's sharing. Prof? You are there? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, uh, so I yes. shall hand it over to you then. Sure, Thank definitely. You. Thank you. Let me share my deck. All right, just checking that you can see my deck. Yes, okay, you can. Uh, yes, thank you so much. So uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my privilege to be able to share an afternoon with you. Um, now, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me, and hopefully I'm not too boring for you after lunch. Um, today, I'm going to just share some of my thoughts on um, how having a family governance and the family charter, or more commonly called the family constitution, and the family supervisory board, very commonly called the family council as well, are just key components under the broader family governance. So today, I would like to share some of my experiences, some of my thoughts on how having family governance could actually facilitate the sustainability of family businesses through generation. Okay. Without further ado, all right, this is the synopsis of the talk. Just in case I over talk and couldn't get to the end, I would like to give you a so-called a broad overview of what the talk will be about. Now, very often we heard this in different languages. Wealth does not last through three generations. I can repeat this in Japanese. I can repeat this in Latin or in French or in Mandarin. All right. But essentially, this is a very popular and sometimes a true saying. But sometimes it is a myth. So when exactly is this a myth? And when exactly is this the truth? It depends on how family plans. Very commonly, we see uh, legal corporate structure, such as holding companies family trusts, families that had their wealth lasted through generation had this legal corporate structure. Families that failed to last through three generations had similar legal structure, such as holding company and family trust. So is planning or is sustainability of family businesses merely about having certain corporate legal structure? Or perhaps there is some additional act factors that is at play. So today, I hope to share on one of the X factor, we call it family governance. And hopefully that is going to help some of you guys running family business plan way, way in advance for succession planning. 
All right. Now, I love to watch uh, Korean drama. I'm sure many of you share my uh, joy in watching Korean drama, not just because the actors and actresses are good looking. All right. Now, but also the storyline of family feud, of corporate contests are so real. Indeed, family feud are real. So let me share with you this recent article uh, in the uh, Singapore Straits Time, dated 21st Jan 2020. That was during the pandemic. All right. Now, even the title of this article, I think, is sufficient to create a new Korean drama already. It says here, billionaire founder of Lotte Group, leave no will. Wow, the plot starts. Let the plotting begin. All right. And I love this writer. All right. She started with uh, one phrase or two phrases. It was once a great blessing for an emperor to have a son. Emperor wants to have a son for sure. All right. We want to have uh, a many Asian family would like to have a son. Okay, definitely. But if he has more than one, the problem starts. Succession could threaten to unravel the empire, especially if his grip was weak. Now, if we look into history, all right, emperor often select a crown prince. And by doing so, all right, it lends assurance to the imperial court that there will be continuity and succession being done to consolidate the dynasty. Now, if we adopt the same concept to a family business that wants to last for a dynasty, then we need an heir designate. Okay. Back to the case of Lotte Group. Surprisingly, the late Mr. Shin, the father, never established a clear heir apparent. And miraculously, he didn't even, even have a will. He's a billionaire, for sure. I'm pretty sure surrounding him, he has no lack of private bankers, no lack of family consultant, no lack of wealth advisor. So why didn't he do that? All right. Unsurprisingly, all right, the family fight because he has more than one son. So there are two, bro there are two sons, um, Mr. Shin Tong Ju, all right, the elder one at 61 year old, and Mr. Shin Dong Bing. And even before the father passes away, all right, the late Mr. Shin, before he passes away, his mental capacity was already more or less gone. He has dementia. All right? So when the father was still alive, but his grip has weakened, just like the emperor, all right? the son starts to fight because there was no clear air dissonance. Now, the second brother removed the elder brother from the company. The elder brother called to sue him. All right, so the plot starts. All right, and under the second brother's uh, leadership, we see a conglomerate discount of Lotte Corp up to 45.8%. Wow. The conglomerate discount, this means that if you break up the conglomerate into the standalone subsidiaries, you're going to uncover, all right, US 1.5 billion, which is equivalent to 45.8% discount. All right, you're going to uncover US 1.5 billion as shareholder value. So the conglomerate is better off breaking up. So it seems, right? Now, this is a family feud, right? We are very keen to watch what's going to happen next. All right? I'm pretty sure perhaps this is going to be a storyline of another award-winning Korean drama. So in this case, let's recap. That's a family business, all right? There is actually a legal corporate structure called a holding company that consolidate the shares and the subsidiaries. Okay. But the problem is, there was no clear succession planning. There was no clear heir apparent, and he has more than one son. Right? So it's a classic emperor problem. Okay. So this led to a family feud, a fight for control, and undervaluation of the conglomerate. And typically, when family fights, right, one rival faction, in order to gain control or power, over the other rival faction. They may make some corporate decision, all right? We call it a control contest strategy, all right? That overall is going to effectively dilute the family control over the conglomerate, but at the individual faction level, it benefits their personal agenda. 
So in this case, actually the second brother, he planned to IPO a crowd jewel. And in doing so, is going to enhance his own, his own power, at the same time weaken his eldest brother control over the empire. Okay. Now, this may not be optimal for the overall family. All right, closer to home. All right, I'm not trying to give you a lot of grayish uh, so-called news after launch. I will give you some happiness subsequently by showing you some successes, right? But let's uh, bite the medicine first, the bitter medicine first, and start with the bad news. Okay? Now, this is closer to home. This is uh, Yo Hyap Singh. I love their drinks, right? The Yo family name is still printed on the drinks, but unfortunately, the Yo family is no longer in control. Okay. Now, the second generation, Mr. Alan Yo, is the second generation. Unfortunately, he didn't have the support of rival faction of his family. So as the family grow, you had different branches, but you also have more generation. So it became a cousin consortium, right? From a sibling a partnership, right? It become a cousin consortium. Now, unfortunately, he makes some leadership decision or corporate decision that the rival faction, which includes um, essentially his own brothers, as well as the next generation, his nephews, they were against it. Okay. Now, so they voted to remove Mr. Alan Yeo from the company. Mr. Alan Yeo, in order to consolidate his chances of staying on, actually applied to the court to dissolve the family holding company. This was approved. But what happened if you dissolve a legal structure whose intention was actually to consolidate the subsidiaries and the shares at the holding company level. So when you dissolve that legal structure, all the shares will be distributed to the family shareholders, right? And not all family members are involved in the family business. Some of them would want to cash out on the shares, right? And this was what happened. So the shares were distributed because the family holding company were dissolved. Family members starts to sell the shares and quietly a rival, a competitor, right? Orchard Parade holding by the late Mr. Ng Ting Fong, starts to acquire the shares privately on the open market. So we still have the family name yours on the drinks, but unfortunately, the family is no longer in control. So it ended somewhere between the second and third generation. Okay. So in this situation, there is a family business, there is a corporate structure called a holding company, just like Lotte, all right? but it didn't prevent the family feud. All right. And in order to gain control, whoever in charge make a decision that ultimately led to the demise of the family business, he dissolved the holding company. Okay. Now, the third example in Hong Kong, this was very famous. Uh, one used to be one of the largest property developers in Hong Kong, Sang Hong Kai. All right. The family fight and the mother was personally involved. She removed her eldest son. Okay. So what happened, all right, as the family were fighting, of course, it hit the tabloid, okay? Now, in fact, uh, I would leave you guys to Google. It's very juicy stories. In fact, there were rumors that um, eventually one of the brothers went to jail, okay? Because apparently there were rumors that another brother, right, who was a rival faction, with a blow on him and essentially tell ICAC, the Corruption Bureau, that there was some bribery involved. So the family feel intensified to the extent that the siblings were whistleblowing on the wrongdoings of one another, sending each other to jail. Okay. So in this situation, there was actually a, a structure called a family trust. And the holding company and the shares right, of the holding company were put under a trust. But having this legal structure called a trust did not prevent the family from fighting. Okay. Now, I promise to give you successes, good news after launch. All right. It's not all grayish. So the previous three examples, it seems that wealth did not last through three generations. Or before the third generation already, family feud has broken out. Okay. Not to worry. There are many success stories. For example, Walmart is privately owned by the Wharton family. Going strong in the third generation, into the third generation, or at least publicly, we didn't hear about family feud. Okay. 
Mars into the fourth generation already. Yeah, on the vertical axis, you see one, two, three, four into the fourth um, into the fourth generation already. Okay. Now, how did they do it? They make sure the business is closely held by members of the Mars family. How did the Walton family does it? All right. If you take a look, they had holding companies. They had Wharton family holding trust. So they had the same legal structure as the Yu families, as the Sang Hong Kai families, as essentially all right, the Lotte family, okay, the Xin family. So is it just about having legal corporate structure, such as a holding company, a family trust, and that is going to ensure sustainability of family businesses through generation. I think the example would show you there is something extra. Okay. I call that an X factor. All right. Now, is it one X factor or multiple X factors? Perhaps, but definitely there is an extra X factor. All right. So we see that um, it is the truth. Yours did not last through three generations. But it is a myth because Walmart Mars are still going strong. All right. So I'm assuming I will take the question at the end, right? I, I will come back and take the question. I do see that there's a question in the QA already. Allow me to yeah, allow me to finish and then uh, I'll come back to take the question. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Prof. Right, or maybe during the fireside chat, your question will be answered already. I don't know, yeah? But allow us to take it at the end. Okay. Now, what exactly is this X factor or X factors? Okay. Now, this is a very, very old uh, so-called uh, article in a book by the publisher, uh, Williams and uh, Priestel. That's the publisher. The author is Robert D. Reed, is 2003. Okay, why did I choose something so old? Okay, because human behavior, human nature, family feud had not changed with time. The lack of planning had not changed with time. Okay. Now, it is very emotional, I understand, and that's one reason why sometimes we don't plan. Okay. Um, the article, the title is Preparing the Heirs, Five Steps to a Successful Transition of Family Wealth and Value, and that may answer part of the, uh, the question in the Q&A. How do we prepare? Okay. Now, if you understand what causes failure, okay, that helps us prepare. So of the 70% of the wealth transition plan that failed, 60% are due to a breakdown of trust and communication within the family. Okay. Now, trust and communication. Right. Fast forward to today, if you read reports about family succession planning, this word trust and communication is again going to jump out at you. Right? So although the article was 203, things have pretty much not changed. Okay. All right, a further 25%, the second bullet point, a further 25% due to the failure to prepare the next generation for what is to come. All right. So I understand, uh, I grew up in actually two family businesses on both the paternal side and the maternal side. My grandparents never had time for the children, okay? Because they were always fighting fire. And, all right, they would just tell the children, you go work in the family business, all right? And they expect that somehow, all right, uh, the children will groom themselves to become leaders, okay? And all of a sudden, the parents die or become ill and unable to control with the business, uh, unable to continue with the business. And the next gen really had no idea what to do. Okay. So it is essentially also preparing the next gen as early as possible. All right. I will give a sense of some timeline. Okay. So I would indirectly be answering the Q&A. Maybe I will answer your question already. Okay. Let me move on. Okay. So trust, number one, 60% of us, the 70% failures uh, are due to a lack of uh, trust and communication. So how do we build trust and communication, the X factors beyond all the legal corporate structure in order to sustain family harmony and the family business through generation? I would like to propose this big word, it's very big, 
is called family governance. So what exactly is family governance? It's pretty much like corporate governance, all right? Except it is applied to family. Okay. Now, the key functions of a family governance, governance structure, I've listed the five key functions and I have bullet in red, all right? And if you look at the words bold in red, you do see communication, inform, communication, communication coming together, right? At the end of the day, is communication to build trust, okay? Now, the first function, the families and values, all businesses have a mission, has, has a vision and a mission. But importantly, the family has unique family values that they would like to infuse into the family business. So communicating the family values, the mission, and the long-term vision to all fam family members are important, all right? You need to tell the family members why you should be proud to be part of this family, okay? Now, the second function, keeping family members, especially those who are not involved in the business, they could be passive shareholders, all right? Or minority shareholders, passive because they are not involved in the family business, but they don't want to be shortchanged. They don't want to be expropriated. And therefore, if we do not keep all family members informed about major business accomplishment, challenges and direction, all right, you would have some so-called unhappiness and the unhappy family members could be second guessing, spreading rumors, creating undercurrent. And that essentially is going to break what we call, all right, the unity and harmony of the family. So keeping everybody informed is very important. Now, the third function, all right, definitely, all right, if I own shares and I'm not the decision maker, I care about what are the benefits I could obtain from owning the shares. I care about dividends. So importantly for Mandy, tell me about my dividend payout policy, all right? And I may have children, all right? My children may really want to join the family business, but I need to know the family employment policy. Is it going to be fair to my children? Now, um, I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, I come from the second branch, all right? I can share with you, okay? Um, I have three great-grandmothers, eh? okay? I have three great-grandmothers on my father's side, paternal side, okay? We come from two, two sides, uh, both family businesses, okay? My paternal father, um, manufacturer in Malaysia, okay? All right, I have three great-grandmothers great from my paternal grandfather's side, okay? Um, I have a, a step-grandmother, all right, from my maternal um, side, and they manufacture in Tunisia, okay? So imagine the complexity, all right? Okay, so I grew up in a very complex environment, very fun, okay? Learning how to manage people from very young, okay? Now, what happened is, all right, we need to, we need to know, all right, is it fair? How are decisions being made? Is it fair across all the branches? I come from the second branch, okay? So if my children want to join the family business, are they inferior to the children of the first branch? Right? So we need to know and we need to communicate the rules and decision and importantly, to be fair and impartial. All right. To be honest, it's easier said than done. Okay? But essentially, that is the end goal, to be fair and impartial. All right. Now, the fourth function, establishing formal communication channels. So Mandy had a complaint. My children entered the family business. All right. And I'm the second branch. The first branch, the children enter as well but they are given accelerated promotion. My children has been there for donkey years and never had a chance to be promoted. Mandy wants to file a complaint. Where do I go? All right. There must be a formal communication channels and that is when the family counselor or the family supervisory board plays an important role. Okay. Now, the third function, we must allow the family to bond together. So there must be activities, there must be events for the family to come together to build relationship. But importantly, many of the family feuds started after the founder or the patriarch or matriarch are gone. For very simple reason, when the patriarch and matriarch are around, decisions are made by them. 
and the children execute, meaning they never had a chance to agree right, with other siblings in order to disagree. They do not know how to agree all, all right, in order to disagree with one another okay, at the siblings level. They just follow the instruction of the parents. And when they are parachuted into leadership position, they do not know how to make decision and come to consensus among the siblings. That is when the family feud is going to break out. Okay, so these are the key functions of a family governance structure. Right. Next, um, the title of this talk is about a family charter and a fam family supervisory board. Okay, these are major constituent of a family governance structure. Right? So the family charter, or commonly called a family constitution. Right? I emphasize here, it is a document. So prior to joining SMU, I was a family business consultant. And a family telling me, Mandy, it's just a document. Right? I said, sure. But the key word is, it is a living document. You can make it living. And if you make it living, it's going to, going to benefit your family. But if you make it a dead document, that means a document that you set up and you archived it. All right? then it is of no use to you. So it is a living document that you need to act on it. And this part about acting on it, that's the difficult part because it involves a lot of discipline from the part of the family. There is the carrot and there is the steak and you need to enforce the steak and not just give carrots. Okay. Now, a living document that I would suggest, all right, that you revisit, the family had to revisit at least on an annual basis, but it is a document that clearly states the family vision, the value system, the mission, and policy that's going to regulate the family member's relationship with the business. So this is key. This document governs the family member's relationship with the business. For example, who within the family in the next gen qualify to enter all right into the family business as a management associate it is according to the selection or employment policy for the family documented in the family constitution all right each family is unique so interestingly when i was a family business consultant i had one family that says mandy well we don't really have time Okay, why don't you just uh, give us a template, yeah? All right, pluck it from another family who has done the family constitution and uh, we will just tweet a little bit for our family. I told them it's not going to work because each family is unique. Each family dynamic is different from the other family. So typically, the form and the content differ from one family business to another and on average, the family takes about half a year, all right? to set up such a constitution because you need to get agreement, you need to get inputs, you need to circulate for consultation with all family members and you need to review it, you need to tighten it and subsequently when all family members agree, this is the living document that represents us as a family, all right? Then they sign off on it, it is done, all right? So it is not a one size fit all. You can't use the template of another family for your own family. Okay. All right. Now, that's the family constitution. Who is going to enforce or make the family constitution alive? We had the family institution. The family institution had to bring to life right? what would other, otherwise be a dead document, a static document. Okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about family assembly, family council commonly called a family supervisory board and other family subcommittees. Okay. So to recap, under the family governance structure, there are two major components, the family charter and family institution. Now, uh, maybe a schematic is going to help. Okay, let's take a look at this one, yeah? On, uh, at least on my left side, okay, is the uh, corporate governance structure. 
on the right side is a family governance, right? Because the family essentially, all right, will become shareholders and employees of their family business and management of their family business. The family governance structure is going to be critical to enhance the corporate governance structure of the company as well. Okay. Let me focus on the family governance structure. Uh, on the top, you see a family assembly. It says whole family. This is commonly what we call a Tao Hall. Okay. So I work with a university, right? My dean, every half a year, he had a Tao Hall. Yeah. You can consider the Lee Kong Chen School of Business as one, one big family. So our Tao Hall is the family assembly. All right. It involves the entire family. You need to keep them informed. Now, then you have more exclusive, more focused, and more dedicated task groups to take care of different needs, different challenges of the family. Right. This is the family advisory board or the family supervisory board, or more commonly, we call it a family council. All right. Under the family council, you could have subcommittee. Subcommittee one, two, three, four, five. All right. So very commonly under the subcommittee, you would have a conflict resolution committee, conflict resolution, because let's face it, we are human. We fight for our economic interests, all right? For non-economic interests as well, we do fight. So one of the subcommittee could be a conflict resolution committee. Now, if the conflict, so Mandy had a complaint, my children are treated unfairly than the first branch children. I would have a former communication channel. I go to the conflict resolution committee. I raise a complaint, ask them to look into this, all right? They would conduct just like in a corporation, in a professional manner, I hope, an inquiry into whether, whether Mandy's complaint is valid or not. All right. Now, if the conflict resolution committee couldn't solve my complaint at their level, they would ex escalate to the family elders. So the family elders are respected, respected. The word is respected members of the family, whereby different branches of the family would listen to them because they are very wise and different generation would respect them and listen to them as well, okay? Now, anything that cannot be resolved, you're going to escalate up to the family council, family board, okay? So essentially, this is um, a schematic of the family governance structure. Why is this important? You do see an arrow, a bi-directional arrow, this is essentially the interaction between the family and the family business. So the family council is going to decide on family employment. Um, I wouldn't say that the family council decide on the family employment policy. They are instrumental in gathering all the inputs from the family members and in putting together the family employment policy into a living document called the family charter. So the family council or the family supervisory board is the key body that is going to implement and force that family constitution to make it alive, all right? So there will be a family employment policy and Mandy complaint is about unfairness, all right? So the family committee, all right, or the family council is going to look into my complaint, all right? And essentially, all right, address it. If it's unfair, they would change. They would essentially all right, raise in the family assembly, raise up in the family assembly, saying that there is a proposition from Mandy, all right, of certain unfair uh, uh, practices under the family employment policy. And now we need to revise the family employment policy in the family constitution. And typically to keep everybody informed, this would be proposed in the family assembly. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on. Okay, so what exactly is this living document? Now, uh, this is as comprehensive as it could be, but if your family had additional needs, you add on. It. Okay, uh, I have two articles. Uh, they are written in Mandarin. I have two articles in the Chinese newspapers, uh, Zhao Bao in Singapore. And one of the articles 
is about defining family members. Why is this important? And one of the consultancy projects I've done, the family is about 50, all right? Across three generations, five different branches, about 50 packs in total. They spend two days just deciding who are my family members. Now, why is this important? Because if that person is recognized as a family member, he or she has the right to inherit the shares, the family business shares. He or she has the right to become employee. All right. And you can see why this is important. So I would just throw out a key question. Typically, we consider family members as bloodline, our children. But the family unit is dwindling. We no longer have 15 children. We have probably two children in China, all right, for the longest time is one child policy, one child. So if you define your family members as just your bloodline, you have a very limited pool. What about son-in-law, daughters-in-law? Are they your family members? If you said my daughter-in-law is my family members, then your daughter-in-law had the right to inherit the shares of your family business and to join your family business and to become senior management. Okay, Defining the family members is going to become more important for future generation for, simple, for a very simple reason. The traditional idea of marriage or family structure is changing. We had non-traditional marriages whereby you see civil partnership, just partnership, no legal marriage. So if your son or your daughter is living with a long-term partner, is that long-term partner considered a family member? If yes, he or she has the right to inherit your family business shares, has the right to join your family as an employee. Okay, so defining properly family members is going to reduce a lot of conflict. All right, now I want to point out a few key ones. So definitely there will be family vision, mission goals, family values, uh, family norms. All right, there is something called a family fund. Okay, I will come a little bit to why this family fund is important. Also the family human resource policy is about family employment policy. All right, and this is important. Now, certain families want to give back to society. So a family philanthropy plan is important as well. All right. Another uh, critical uh, component is the family shareholder agreement. All right. Very often, in order to consolidate the shares, the holding company shares within the family, all right, there will be a clause in the family shareholder agreement that says that family shareholders must give the family the first right of refusal to buy back the shares before they can sell to an external party. This is to prevent your competitors from taking over the family shares in the open market. Okay, now, so a family shareholder agreement is important to build that common understanding of whether we can anyhow sell our shares. All right, you see things are pre-nuptial, post-nuptial. And importantly, if Mandy doesn't want to be a family anymore, if I don't want to be a family anymore, all right, just like Prince Harry, the royal family has seen exit, all right, in one of the princes, if Mandy doesn't want to be family anymore, there must be an exit option for Man Mandy in the constitution. And if I do not want to be a family shareholder anymore, there must be an exit option for Mandy. Okay, And every year, because the family constitution is a living document, there must be some rules and decision-making process on how to amend the constitution. Okay, So I leave you guys all right, uh, to internalize the many, many components here, but I'm going to just point out um, maybe two key components to illustrate. All right, I'm just mindful of time because I tend to over talk. Okay. Now, this is a recent, uh, maybe not so recent, six years already, uh, dated Jan 26, 2016 in the Singapore Straits time. Okay. What are the biggest challenges 
facing family business in Singapore. 64.7% size, attracting talent. And talent could be internal talent. Internal talent, it means family members. External talent means non-family members. So one of the key challenges and a top challenge is attracting talent, both internal and external. The second, 54.1% size, it is succession planning, okay? which could be linked to the difficulty to attract internal and external talent. Okay. Now, so what did the respondent, what did the family businesses try to do? They tried to interest the next generation. This is the internal talent. 61% says we provide internship. So this points down to the family employment policy, right? providing internship. 50% allow diversification into new areas. Right? Now, in order to support the next gen, some of them are very keen to join the family business, okay? but really had a view that the traditional business needs to evolve differently and maybe more high tech. So a traditional food manufacturing business probably had to include food tech these days, vertical farming and whatnot. All right. In order to attract your internal talent, you need to essentially support them in their new ventures. To support them in their new ventures, you need funding. Right. And that is when a family fund becomes important. The family HR policy is going to define a well-structured internship that would help to attract your younger generation into joining the family business because they do see a personal development. They see progression in the family business, but importantly, personal development, right? Now, the family HR policy, or I like to call it a family employment policy, okay, could work wonders to attract external talent as well. Very often, the external employees, the external talent, they worry about being second class to the family employees, all right? Let's be very rare here. In my experiences as a family consultant, I had this conversation with a father. Uh, he has listed companies um, across three different countries. Okay? He's about 70 each year old. I had this conversation. I said, sir, all right, maybe you should consider using professional managers and changing the family employment policy to be fairer, to allow the external talent to at least have a chance to move into the C-suite. Okay. He told me, no, I'm the owner. Only my bloodline would move into the C-suite. Right. Uh, so, this is one concern, okay? External talent, if they never, never had a chance to move into the C-suite, I don't think they'll be looking at your family business. They will be looking at maybe an investment banking job, another MMC job, okay? All right. The family employment policy, right, is going to also work wonders in attracting the next gen within the family. So as previously mentioned, there are a lot of rivalries across uh, family branches on who is regarded as the first, second, and third. Okay, And if the family employment policy is unfair or even non-existent, right, then the rivalry is going to intensify and it is very difficult to attract the next gen who had talent to want to be part of the family business. Okay, Now, Allow me to share. I think I have time to share with you guys. Okay. Allow me to share an extract from a family employment policy of uh, this company called Sabis. It's a US company. Um, I had um, actually bounced this employment policy to a number of Asian uh, families that previously I was consulting to. They all love it, right? But they told me, I don't think 
we are able to implement this because we love our family too much. Okay. Now, this employment policy, family employment policy, is extremely professional to the extent of being institutional. This is what a commercial corporate company would do. Okay. It could be a little bit overly commercial. All right. But let's look at that as the end goal in mind, because after all, we want to professionalize our business. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at the employment philosophy. It says the driving force behind our decision should be the best interest of the organization and not that of any individual family members. Importantly, right? Don't feel entitled that a job in the family business is above right. It is neither above right nor an obligation. Thirdly, this is very strong, okay? The second point is very strong. Neither above right nor an obligation. Thirdly, you'll be treated the same as external employees. Number four, all right? We can't afford to carry you if you don't have contribution, all right? So essentially, what this says is, don't look at the family employment as a retirement job. It's not a retirement job. If you're above 40 year old, so next year under age limit, they did specify. It's not a retirement job. So if you're 40 year old, we would properly evaluate whether you're suitable or not, right? Because we don't want to attract family members with the intention of retiring at the family business to join us. Okay. Now, next, under part B, existence of an open position. So this company, this family business, will not create a position for our family members unless the business needs justify it. And importantly, they will not make room for a family member by dismissing external employees. Right? This is important right? to address the perception that external employees are second-class citizens in family business. All right? If the per perception persists, you can't attract the external talent. Now, for the next gen, and uh, I had to say I have the privilege of um, mingling with a lot of next gen, both on my Master of Science in Wealth Management, but also uh, in the undergraduate body at SMU. We had many of them. My students are forever, all right? Uh, the undergrad are forever, 21-year-old to 24-year-old, all right? Despite me aging every year, they are forever 21 to 24, okay? Now, the next gen care about their personal development. They care about their future market value. And therefore, the employment policy must encompass personal development, training, internship, rotation, coaching, mentoring, okay? And different variety of exposure to grow the skill set, to enhance the personal development of the next gen. Okay, so this is essentially an example, just a few examples extract from the family employment policy of a family business in the US. Okay. So who enforced? We had this document, all right? It's just like um, having the law, but there's no policeman, there's no judges, no court to enforce it. And then having the law on paper, that would be useless. So we need the family counsel to be the policeman, yeah, to be the judge, to come in and administer and enhance the family constitution. So the family council is a working governing body, and this is elected by the family members. Okay? Now, you do not need a, a, a council. You do not need a family council if you are a family of five. All right? But if your family reach a critical size, typically 30 members or more, then you need a counselor. Okay. The counselor is going to just administ administer and enforce the family constitution and oversees a number of subcommittees. So some examples of uh, some of the subcommittees, some examples of some would be an education committee. All right, you need to plan a family education program and in induction and development program for family members who are going to join the family business. Yeah. Um, under the uh, family constitution, 
right? Uh, let me go back to the family constitution. Under the family constitution, you see the exit, one of the component is exit of shareholding policy. Definitely, you need a share redemption committee, right? Because different family members have different liquidity needs. Some of them, they may not want to sell the family shares, but they had to, right? Because they had a need for liquidity, a need for cash. So in order to prevent the shares from being sold on the open market, a share redemption committee had to be set up, right? And a family fund has to be set up to buy back the shares at the level of the family, okay? Or essentially to match family members who had the means and desire to buy more family shares from those who wants to exit, okay? Now, this is important, family events. This is for the family to come together and communicate and build trust. The keyword is trust, which comes from communication, okay? So I had a, for my family, maybe I would just um, use my own family as an example. We aren't very big, but I'm the fourth generation. Um, so my cousins, uh, we live in uh, largely three different uh, geographical areas, which is quite typical of large families. Um, some of my cousins live in the US, all right? And they are citizens, US citizens. I live in Singapore. All right, another branch live in China and under lockdown right now, okay? And we have some families who are in Malaysia, okay? So we are geographically dispersed. How do we keep in contact with one another, all right? It could be digital means, but I'm not a believer in uh, forging close relationship by just seeing each other on Zoom, all right? I believe in coming together physically for an event and building the friendship and the bond, okay? So for my family, the biggest event, all right, annually, and all families members would try to come back for this event, all right, is called Qingming, the traditional Chinese uh, um, ceremony, um, so-called uh, paying respect to our ancestor, okay? All right, Qingming, we would gather together and we would go to the grave of our ancestor, all right, to pay respect to them. So this is a major event to be organized, right? And therefore, you need to have a family event committee. Now, I've mentioned about attracting your next generation and giving them uh, some funds and some mentoring to start new business segment. You need a new venture fund, all right? And conflict resolution, I've mentioned that already, is very important, okay? So for your own family, if there is any particular needs, then you set up that subcommittee for your family, okay? So for my own family, um, we aren't that uh, so-called productive. My own family, we aren't that productive in producing the next generation. So my family is rapidly aging. So for, for, for my family, we have talked about setting up a healthcare and welfare fund, okay? For the uh, older generation in my family, yeah, to take care of them. Now, so what is the, why are we doing all this? Okay. The end goal is to build trust and communication. And with trust and communication, hopefully we can sustain the family business over multiple generation, all right? If not forever, okay? So with that, I've actually come to my last slide. If there is any particular slide or any content that you want to revisit, right? I'm happy to do that. But I've come to my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Mandy. Any questions for Prof. Mandy? You, we actually, Prof. We do have one question in the Q and A. But um, would you like to take it now, or we can also leave it to the end of that discussion session, the fireside chat session. We can take it together with the rest of the questions. Then. Okay. How should a family business start to distribute to the next gen? Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm think. Okay. So, uh, maybe, uh, if I may, uh, just cl clarify, yeah? Distribute. You mean distribute shares? I mean, I would, uh. I would uh, take it that you mean to distribute the shares. Yeah? All right? I, I would take it that uh, is to distribute the, the shares to the next gen. 
Okay. Well, each family is unique. I share with you uh, one family. Okay. I share with you one family. They put in their family constitution. Okay. Before we distribute shares to our children, they must be married. Okay. And the marriage must be stable for at least five years. All right. Because once they distribute the shares and if they do not have a trust to ring fence, they just distribute shares, right? To the uh, children, all right? And uh, the, unfortunately, the children marry a gold digger, all right? And at the point of marriage, the shares were given as a wedding gift, all right? Subsequently, three years down the road, you need minimum three years for a so-called a cordial divorce, four years, that's Singapore, for a hostile divorce, all right? Of course, if you want to fight, the divorce will take much longer, but typically, minimally three years down the road, if the son marry a gold digger, that gold digger wants to divorce the son, all right? Uh, and the marriage takes place in Singapore, all right? According to our women charter, half of your shares will go to the uh, ex-spouse, so-called ex-spouse right now. So there's dilution of the family shares. Okay, so it's unique to your jurisdiction, it's unique to your own dynamics, but I can share, some family says, my children must be of definitely of legal age, all right? First of all, definitely they, they must be of legal age. In Singapore, it's 21 year old. But of legal age for certain family is not good enough. They must assess the maturity. And very often, many of them use marriage to assess the maturity of their offsprings to receive the shares. And some of them, not at the point of marriage, they want to observe the spouse, the spouses for X number of years, all right, to make sure that uh, they uh, the, the children has not married a gold digger, okay? Now, certain families, and you do see this often in big families, maybe Hong Kong families, uh, but not just Hong Kong families, you see this in big families, right? They will only distribute the shares to the son if the son has produced a son, meaning I need to see that my children have produced, all right, bloodline descendant for me, all right, then I would distribute the shares to my son. Okay, so I, I can't give you a blanket answer. I give you some examples. Wow, nice. There are so many things to really look at. Thankfully, I'm not rich if that's the case. <laughs> uh, no, actually, wealth, wealth can be a great blessing if you plan. But if you don't plan well, it becomes a huge burden. So hopefully, I mean, my sharing is able to help you plan so that wealth, your wealth become a blessing. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Okay, now with this session, if you have any questions, please keep it coming via the live chat uh, box, all right? So that you can put in the questions and then we can address them later on. So now uh, we are inviting in Kun Yu to join in the discussion, the fireside chat on how do you ensure sustainability of a family business with the right set of family charter and family business work. Basically, it's really to join in Prof Mandy, join Prof Mandy in this robust discussion. And this session is to be moderated by Alex, the Senior Advisor at SEC. So Alex, I shall hand it over to you to kickstart the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, and uh, welcome to the audience. Uh, I'm sure you were as wrapped as I was around that, uh, what would normally be a very long uh, lecture. I thought it felt very short to me because it was so with information and really, really worthwhile. And I immediately, the, the question came to me. We have, of course, large Chinese families all over, or large families and mainly Chinese all over Southeast Asia, many of them here in Thailand, many of them going through the stages that Professor Mandy mentioned and being third and fourth generation, some of them quite successfully and quite admirably, I must say. But I would like to, to open the question myself by asking uh, Mandy, what, what percentage in your experience, what percentage of families actually have a formal structure of some kind, whatever they call it, a council or a charter or a Constitution. What what percentage of the families that you dealt with actually have one of those? And it's more than more than just an understood uh, expression, but a real written down uh, document that they come back to every year, as you suggested. Uh, I would say in recent years, okay, uh, there is huge interest from Chinese family from China to set this up. Okay. 
So uh, Chinese families, all right, seems to believe in this. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned, all right, the document is just a document. So if you just set it out and archived it, it is not a living document. So how they enforce, I'm not sure. All right. But recently, we do, um, in recent years, we see a lot of interest from Chinese families. Now, I had to say that I'm not seeing a lot of interest from Singapore families, but I'm aware some of the big ones, okay, the bigger ones, all right, uh, typically, um, instead of calling them family business, they have become business families, all right? <laughs> they do have in place uh, such a constitution. And perhaps that's, that has facilitated their transition from a family business to a business family. Okay, but uh, I think more can be done in the region for sure. We are doing a lot of education on why a family governance is important, why this document is important, and even the private banks. We are having a lot of family offices coming to Singapore to set up. All right, this morning I just heard in the past four months, one hundred family offices have been approved by uh, so-called our central bank. All right, so for typically a key step when you set up a family office. All right. Any advisor is going to suggest you have to figure out what you want to do with your family office. All right. And the very first step is to come up with a family charter. Okay. So with the rise of family office in Singapore, all right, naturally, I'm going to assume each of them have set up something like a family charter. But, but how actively it has been enforced, uh, enforced all right, uh, I have no numbers. I see. Well, let, let me introduce uh, Kun Chinook Pong, who's Hello. a member of a family here in Thailand, and ask her if, I, I don't want to get too personal, so please, if I do, just, just tell me, you know, I'm too personal and don't, don't answer it. But is, does, has your family uh, initiated such a process or are they thinking about doing such a process? Um. If, so where, where are you in that in that development? Uh, I, I have to say, like my family, not really think about family charter, family councils or anything. But um, I, I get to know about that the there this kind of um, practice when I was in um, one of the program like for young entrepreneur, and they uh, have given us like this concept and this process and I think is one of the uh, thing that we need to do in a family business because when I um, like like my family which is small only five members mm -hmm. but we do have big family but not joining in line of family business so only a family members that we do business they are um, like everywhere around like um, my sister and my brother they're in Australia and I'm in Thailand so I'm lucky enough to stay close with my parents and lucky enough to have a lot of issues and conflict in uh, managing and operating in a business as well um, so what I would say that they they don't know about this thing so Actually, I'm in kind of process of learning and trying to introduce this to tell them like, um, why should we have this like family charter or um, more a lot of communication within the family? Because we rarely, because like we are different parts of the world, right? And we rarely um, speak with each other like gathering like you know family gathering or have like a serious meeting family meeting and to make decisions or in, in business or anything else so yeah i could see how that would be a real challenge if you couldn't come together for special occasions like Ching Ming, like uh, mandy suggested which should be that's a pity do you have you felt there's a strain because of that between among the members of the family, or is it just something you'd like to see ironed out, to make things a little more regular? Um, because to be honest, personally, I would prefer working like some other corporates, but due to um, our family business, we only have like um, small members and three siblings. 
So I, I think it's necessary to have more communication within the family. Like um, my, my father and my dad, uh, my father and my mom, they both are like a baby boomer. And when they start doing business, they just, you know, work, work all the time. So they don't really have time spending with their children when they were young. And once like um, all their children like finish their university, um, they, it, it's more like conversation during the dining table and things like that, that, oh, okay, um, like now we are doing this and that, why don't you come like help with this? It's more like telling what you need to do instead of like um, ask whether if you prefer to join in the business. So um, for me, when I finished university, I straight away joined the other corporate. And what I've been working in the corporate, I, I see like um, the structure and uh, the management style in, in different corporates. And when I come back and trying to apply those um, concepts, there is a conflict because um, one of the important things that family business, especially small one, need to uh, consider is like a corporate structure. When it's small, right, um, it's just top management and then it's um, another level um, employees like um, administrative, which they don't really have, they don't really talk about or share the business strategy or, you know, so most of the strategies and decision is made by um, all the family members, just my, like my parents or my, my sisters, yeah. So do you think that it's an advantage to start with a charter and, and that quote unquote, the corporate organization you've suggested? while you're small or would, would it be better to wait until you were a larger, a larger group? You mean like for our family business when it's right. big, right? right. right. Um, I, I think it's easier to join when the family business is small because um, the earlier you plan ahead, it's the better planning for like family charters or um, a meeting, doing the family business, making decisions and everything like that. Yeah. Uh, back to, to Mandy, do you, do you, when you're in your experience, is it difficult to raise the question or the suggestion of establishing a charter with some of the older families that, that haven't yet uh, begun that? Uh, no, actually most of them, uh, they understand uh, you know, the, the, the family charter is good to have. It doesn't hurt them to set up something like this. What hurts them is the implementation. <laughs> having that document, all right, having law doesn't hurt us if nobody is going to enforce it, right? We can always write something up, all right? But if uh, writing an employment policy, my dean write up an employment policy and Mandy had to fulfill and be disciplined if I violate, ah, that is the problem, okay? So having a document, doesn't really hurt, especially most families when they had multiple children, all right? And they would set up a basic version of it, all right? If the family structure is small, like five, right? Well, two, two parents and three children, all right? They would set up a simple one. And essentially, it's to set up certain parameters to attract their children into the family business, to tell them about, if you join my family business, these are your progression, your development, these are the terms and conditions and welfare, a very simple one. But I think the family constitution is a living document. So when the children got married, that is, you have the in-laws, complications make in, it's more complex. And then you enhance the family constitution, you revisit. And then subsequently you have the next gen, all right? You have your grandchildren coming on board. So as the family structure expand, as the family size expand, you keep on revisiting it to add more sophistication. But it never hurt to set up a document, a guidance, right? A guidance, okay. To be effective, to ensure sustainability, it's enforcing. So I don't mind sharing an example with you. Uh, is the second gen and a family in the ASEAN country, they have five children. 
which consider relatively big family, five children, right? Uh, everything was going well. They don't have a constitution until the son, the elder son, marry. Okay, and there was a related party transaction because the elder son marry the wife side runs another family business, and the wife side wants to be supplier. All right, to uh, essentially the son's family business. All right. Now, there was no clear rules in the family policy. If you have a conflict of interest like this, all right, how should they send in the proposal? Should it be disclosed that whoever is tendering all right, uh, as a under procurement okay, uh, in my family business, do, do, is, is there a need to disclose that actually this is my son's in-laws? It's not clear. All right. So the son-in-laws just sent in a proposal, just like any corporate supplier would, without disclosing, they actually had insider information. They know the pricing because they are the in-laws, okay? And they want, and it was after the fact that it was discovered as the in-laws. The in-laws set up a company under nominee shareholders, so let's put it this way, all right? So it's, it's, it's a clear case of related party transaction. There was no family governance whatsoever. Uh, to put properly the parameters, what to do when such a case happened. Okay, so that was when the family, all right, decided to set up a family charter because now they had in-laws. The, the elder son had a wife already, and this happened, and there are four other children who would be getting married soon. Okay, all right. So these are things that uh, you think about uh, when bad things happen and when your family dynamics become more complex. Yeah, I I, I can imagine. That that's one of the many things that would be overlooked when you were trying to come up with a with a charter. I certainly wouldn't have thought of that. Right. Uh, uh, if if my I may add to, to my story, right? So there was sure. no family charter available. Available. The parents doesn't know how to discipline because there was no 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 guidance, no rules set up, right? Okay. And all the uh, employees of the company saw that this is a related party transaction. All right. So by right, the eldest son should be removed from his role as a manager in the company if it's in a corporate world. All right. Probably is a case for dismissal. All right. But the parents loving the children so much, loving the son so much, kept quiet. All right. And they don't have a family charter, fa family governance to guide them. So the family, the parents kept quiet. So you're going to open a can of worm for your four other children to allow their in-laws to come in to do related party transaction. They would be saying that my brother did that, so why can't I, okay? So that is when the uh, parents uh, approach uh, essentially me and a number of my uh, uh, consultants to think about this family charter. To be honest, um, my family, um, I'm the one who approached like um, to seek the professional and assistance to come and help to like, you know, um, give the information about what, why we, we need uh, more meetings in family meeting or concepts or guideline for the children to be followed. Because um, my, my parents, uh, they don't have any guideline or sets of rules but yeah of course since we were young they have like um, a teaching like for basic like things like values that you have to be um, honest or like you know in China all, all Chinese family business um, like this value is kind of important and other things like uh, you have to be work hard and you know, um, help with the family business if you like have time or um, learn all the, what the parents are doing. Mm. So yeah, when, when, when um, I see this uh, family charter, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning it. That's why um, being here, it, it's really good opportunities to, uh, study more of it because um, exec uh, I think it's kind of difficult to execute when um, the rest of the family members not really knows or um, think that it's important enough. But yeah, so now it's the process of convincing. <laughs> That's that was my next question was what do you think is the biggest challenge and if it's if it is convincing 
then certainly you've got a few stories today that you can you can relate to them and and you probably can can uh, find some more which might really help them to realize they they may think because as you say it's a small group we can just sit down and hold hands and come to an agreement but when something such as mandy has suggested happens uh, surprising different angle out of the blue if you will uh, yeah it, it 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 sets everybody on edge and you don't know you don't know what to do so if would you say that you, that's the biggest challenge that you face you face at the at the moment? Uh, um, I would yeah, I, I would say that one of the biggest challenge because uh, well, my my past experience working with family business is because they don't have like set of rule or guidelines. They are very open, but um, when we talk about um, okay, we're going to do this, operate this in the business. What we agree on, like a last few months, but when we did in the next few few months, they they change their their decision all the time. So, uh, and oftentimes, not just myself, but my other my um, sibling, like my brother and sister, uh, like they talk separately. So it's like taking sides as well. So this alignment creates confusion during the business as well. So what I think um, we need in the past is we may, we may need like um, some of the uh, third part, party professional to come into play, um, helping managing the business. Um, but because of we are operating in a family business, they, my, my parents don't prefer to have like a third party professional. So it would be like um, a job for a sibling to convince, to uh, show the information, like why it's necessary to uh, have a family meeting or an event because um, our family don't really uh, have like a family meeting all the time. Usually we FaceTime, but not everyone was like FaceTime all together, right? And it's not gonna work as well, like Professor Mandy was saying. Um, it's, it's th there is no connection or interaction or um, like more in touch when sharing things. So yeah, it, it's, it takes some time. I think timing is also one of the uh, um, things that I have to be um, like taking in consideration as well, because uh, my family, my parents never work in a corporate like before. So um, they don't know the certain level of information like as I or other sibling receive. So our set of information were really different. So it takes some time for them to learn about like um, the family charters or why we need to create this. So. What we are trying or I trying to do is now um, try to convince like to have a proper, a formal family meeting to discuss about like, what's a plan? What's a um, idea of managing business? Because um, I, I've been thinking about this because my sister, my um, older sister, she's married already. Mm -hmm. So we still, um, having a discuss like whether uh, should they come into work or no, or like how are we going to distribute um, shares or funding or anything? Because we never organize or manage anything like that. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds, sounds like a very, really scary challenge to me. You don't <laughs> You don't want to lose your your family or break up the family feeling over yeah, yeah because share. like in in the past year um when there's the before COVID, right you you may all we know that um past few years there are a lot of uh, digital transformation and our corporate still working like um still using papers <laughs> so it, it's quite tough for me to uh, 
like bring author knowledge to share within the employees and um, having to communicate with my parents as well why we need to use the system or um, to have more structure and clear roles for employees like what they um, need to be focusing on so um, because during that experience um, it's quite tough and we have a lot of conflicts and issues and disagreements and when you are um, talking with the family members you all know that uh, they're not going to go away so sometimes you are <laughs> Um, forget to control your emotions. It's not like doing business, right? Um, you know that you're going to lose the, the, this deal. So you have to rule your emotion not to be like um, very aggressive or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I, I think in some cases that this is where outsiders, if you can get the parties to agree you know, within the family can be, a, can be a help. But I do know of families here in Thailand, like your own probably, that are so suspicious of outsiders. Uh, I don't know, there must be a term for it for, for Mandy, but you know, that like to have glass ceilings for female employees elsewhere. I think there must be something like a family ceiling here because it's very, very noticeable when you go into these companies Nobody has to tell you where the line is. You can sense it very quickly. Mm. <laughs> Actually, just look at the surnames and you can tell <laughs> you know, who's who. And, and you can't, and, and you know that uh, if you're an employee, no matter how talented, you know that that line is there and you're not going to break through it. And so it's very discouraging for them uh, to, number one, to join if they're ambitious, and number two, to try to raise their voice or offer any constructive criticism. So it's a very, very difficult situation for them to be in too. Do you have any recommendations, Mandy, for, for company or families that want to bring in professional and how to, how to bring them in without threatening the structure? Uh, honestly, Asian families, unlike European or North American families, very much prefer bloodline, yeah. So I think there is a that that there, there are a two concept that we need to be very clear about. Okay, one we call it ownership succession, ownership succession, passing on the shares, the ownership, the shares, versus leadership succession, or we also call it management succession. In Asian family, all right, perhaps in many families, ownership succession and leadership succession are the same thing. They are one and the same. Meaning, all right, my son must own the shares and be the CEO. Right? In the European culture, and they have passed through for maybe seven generations already, six to seven generations already since the World War, they differentiate. We can be owners. I will pass the shares to my children. All right? So that is ownership succession. But if they are not competent and they are not interested, the management succession need not be them, but they're still owners, all right? So we hire professionals. So I think, all right, this concept, we need education for sure. There's a key difference between ownership succession versus leadership succession. And you can separate the two, all right? So my sense is, uh, you know, uh, pretty much in, in ASEAN uh, and, and in Asia, perhaps it's new money. So we need to go through, uh, hopefully it lasts two, three generations, because if it doesn't, then you don't have that many generations, you know, to, to try out new ideas, right? Okay, so hopefully, all right, from the founder to the next gen, all right, uh, we encounter a little bit of failure, a little bit of unpleasantness, and it, it triggered us to think about all this uh, concept, okay, the difference between management and uh, 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 ownership succession, and to feel the need for a family charter and to implement and enforce that. And hopefully, there's still sufficient wealth to pass from the second to the third. And I believe that once you pass through the, three gen the third generation, more or less, you had all this mechanism in place, right? Uh, as they commonly said, right? Marriages that last two, three years likely to last for 30 years. Okay, so if you can last through three generations, very likely you'll go on. 
I mean, I do education. It's, it's a lot of education. Mm. Yeah. You, do you think that applies in your case? <laughs> I'm still second generation. I still work for it. You, uh, still work on it. <laughs> so it takes some time. Mm. Do you think, but I, I think the argument that Mandy has, has presented is, is, might be helpful in explaining to them that if they bring in professionals, mm. they're not necessarily losing anything. You know, they're just, it's a, it's a monthly salary, end of story, or whatever compensation. So maybe if they understood that a little clearer, it would, it would help them to accept what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think? I, yeah, I think so. Because I always choose this way to, um, how I, what I say, like buffer between myself and my parents. So I'm trying to um, bring in like third party. First, um, yeah, I, I, I bring in professional to come and tell what it is like um, in, in my experience, uh, I want to change the way we operate in the factory, for example. And of course, I'm a young lady, you know, walk in the factory and there is a lot of men in there. So um, it, it might be hard for me how to, how would I behave? So it would be better for me to bring in professional. And that would, I, I was thinking that would be benefit for, for uh, my parents as well. So they know, they can learn from other people. Uh, one of the professional that I was hiring, he was working in like uh, one of the um, car automobiles that they have a very um, systematic like Japanese setting. So he, he knows exactly what he needs to do. But um, because of this professional and um, my parents, they're both, um, how to say, like, I'm good as well, you know, why, why we need you. So there's some like thunder that you never know is going to coming later. So, so it takes some time to, for them to accept because it's never happened before. And usually um, like my sibling, they don't really get involved in the, the company in Thailand because we, we do have distribution center in Australia. So um, my sister and my brother, they will um, work there. So oftentimes when we communicating, we communicate through like FaceTime, um, but individually like my parents and my, my, my siblings. So, I'm the one who like, um, how to say, like directly uh, like face to face with my parents. So most of the time when we stay at home, there, there is very thin line a relationship that they're still young, you still young. You, you know, you don't know what you're doing, things like that. So it's, it's challenging, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I may jump in, all right, okay. I mean, my life, I'm, I'm in my late 40s, yeah? My parents forever think that I don't know anything and I'm still young. Yeah? <laughs> so to our parents, we'll always be young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially when you stay home together and, you know, when you're home, you're freestyle, right? You don't have to act like you're employees and you like behave anything all the time. So um, when you shift to like um, a working station, you, you still have that picture in mind, like when you're at home. So So that's... It, it's very difficult to, to, how to say, differentiate the behavior, how you're gonna, and, and in communication as well, like how, how you're gonna um, treat each other. Hmm. Well, as someone who's older than both of you, unfortunately, I can tell you, it, it doesn't get any easier. We, uh, we tend to assume that everybody who's a year or more under us, less than we are old, is uh, you know not just not quite with it, you know? and it, it's a it's just a challenge. I think you have to overcome in any culture, not just uh, not just in Asia. But I, other than that, though, I I wonder if there's a way, a, a kind of a shortcut that, that you could introduce, maybe not people but techniques into the business that might make it. Uh, less threatening because it's not coming from an individual 
necessarily. It might be coming from a family member and, and therefore less intimidating. Is there some way to do that, do you think, uh, Mandy? Yeah, and that's why now, uh, um, according to the Straits Times article in 2016, right? Um, definitely attracting children, especially when uh, in Singapore, our children are well educated uh, and had a lot of opportunities in the corporate getting them to come back to a traditional family business right, is an up, uphill task. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what the parents have done is to set up a new venture fund. Right? We allow you to diversify from our traditional business. So I've seen the next gen, the, the, the traditional business is very traditional in commodities. Okay. Now the parents allow them to look into using technology and take care of the distribution, the logistic. Yeah. And uh, so allowed them to start a new division and uh, uh, looking at e-commerce, all right? Uh, it's still commodity business, but look at uh, the distribution using e-commerce platform, which they find more sexy uh, and uh, allow them to uh, grow their ideas by setting up a new venture fund, yeah? So this is one way uh, to avoid a really a serious head-on conflict uh, between two generations. Yeah, um, I, I would like to, talk about like um, this issue as well. Um, the reason that I want to, like reason that I want my parents to do the family charters or um, to have like a clear cut guideline or maybe it's not clear cut, but at least some something drafting out, but we have to do it too because um, like, because I don't have, I, I don't know their clear vision, what we should do or their direction, how they want their business in the future be like. So setting up um, a family charter or um, a holding, because we, we do have like um, other business as well. Having a holding that would give um, like other children to have the opportunities to, you know, um, ask for or propose for a fund to do their new venture. Uh, otherwise, um, they have to follow their parents all the time. So having funds for for the next gen or myself, I, I would be more, um, how to say. Give, give, my, give me a chance to, to experience like other business unit. And at least if it's success, um, they can see it as well. Hmm. Excellent, I, I like your point about consistency and predictability. Very, very important for you, particularly in your situation, family situation. I can see how that, that it could also be a challenge as well. We, we actually do have a, uh, another question that's come in uh, for Professor Tom, and to, she, he refers or she refers to the, the uh, Korean dramas and family mm -hmm. feuds, which was very, very moving and very entertaining. Thank you very much, I, I have to say. Uh, and he says he'd like to ask Professor Tom uh, how, how prevalent is this uh, phenomenon of feuding that played out in the drama is in other Asian countries, or is it just a cultural thing within Korea or Korean dramas? As you know, there's so much we see on TV is, is not really reflective of real life. The, the question is how much is how much of it is? I guess. Uh, I think uh, if you if we Google, we can find quite a number of an anecdotal uh, stories and these are not just stories these are actually happening and that's why they are reported in uh, reputable news uh, outlet uh, you, you would find that a few korean families all right are feuding okay and uh, definitely the korean ally family all right uh, some of you guys uh, may have read about that that family is feuding as well okay uh, the lote my example all right so i don't think it is just korean drama Okay, it is really happening. Okay, now uh, the uh, but um, the participant says, uh, are there any other? Oh, is this phenomenon prevalent in other Asian countries? I have seen some. All right, in Indian, 
All right. Uh, there are some stories uh, coming from the uh, Indian continent. In Europe, uh, maybe if I may, you know, I was actually, I went to Switzerland uh, once uh, I could go. I brought my uh, Master of Science in Wealth Management student to learn from uh, the, the Mecca of uh, private banking, Switzerland, right? Mm -hmm. And on my flight on Singapore Airlines, all right, they were screening the house of Gucci. House of Gucci. So uh, oh. may I suggest you watch that movie? All right. <laughs> the family feud to the extent uh, mm -hmm. that the ex-wife killed the husband, yeah. A, uh, mother, yeah, she she actually got. Yeah, uh, I follow. <laughs> uh, you 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 watch that as yeah, well, right? Yeah. Okay, she hired a, a gunman, hitman, okay, mm -hmm. to kill the husband because she's oh. losing control over the husband and uh, some other women come into play. Okay, so at the end of the day, uh, very often it's about in laws, it's about women, right? That's why some families in my earlier response, some families they said my son marriage must be stable, have produced the next gen, the third generation already before I pass on shares. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so so uh. I would say that is not just a cultural thing in Korea, all right? I think in Thailand, probably you had some cases as well. In the Philippines, some cases as well, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, it's everywhere, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I, I would, I, certainly in Thailand, I know we have, we, we just haven't been nicely dramatized like the, like the Korean serial. I think we do have one, we do have one. <laughs> I remember um, the the daughter so um, the mother, um, one of the company that um, producing the, uh, the the sauce in Thailand, and so the mother and it's become the um, big news in Thailand <laughs> because uh, this company is quite um, established like very long, and it's kind of surprised for everyone that the daughter herself is suing the mother, yeah. You know? But but we do have good um the companies as well like uh central that they um doing a very good family charters and have like a clear guideline for their family members to follow. Mm. And and central is one of the really large ones. And yeah, people everywhere. So it's uh it's quite heartening to see that it can be done. I mean there are examples of companies transitioning. You know, into uh, into into more professional uh, surroundings, uh, but it's not inevitable. Mm. It's not inevitable at all. I wonder if if there if there are any warning signs that that either of you could share uh, to that you have to be careful of. Maybe if you don't take care of these warning signs, and something worse may develop. And it could be as, as simple as just bringing in an, an in-law. I mean, there are other sure. Any um, idea? Maybe if I there is the like sent to the court or something. <laughs> that that would be like a a a, a red. It would be a late stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's, 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 there's actually getting uh, acrimonious, uh, very oh, acrimonious okay. uh, 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 already. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, I think that's yes, yes. Sign. That, that's a, that's a, that's shows you it's already too late. I think <laughs> the daughter showing the mother. That's that's pretty sad. So mm -hmm. so typically, my experience is yeah. Uh, typically, with children, if the children are living close by, all right, some parents would like to see them for a uh, 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 dinner at least uh, once uh, one weekend. All right, every month or so, right? Okay. The earliest warning sign is when you start to see that uh, uh, one of your children uh, and the spouse, all right, gives all sorts of excuses not to come for the family reunion dinner, for the family dinner. Mm -hmm. That's when things are already starting to unravel. It's, it's very little signs like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as, as I said, it's, it's important to create family events because if you don't have family events, you can't observe very little but fatal signs. Mm. Like giving excuses not to come for a family reunion dinner. Even Chinese New Year, they refuse to come. Mm. That's a big sign already. Yeah. It, it makes me remind of um, one of the big events, like Chengming, right? That mm -hmm. we go to um, worship our in centers. Um, like, like my dad was calling the, all his siblings, like, you have to come. <laughs> and it's like a mandatory. So, so... 
um, if that happens, like you were saying, it is starting to fade away for the firm relationship to that we have. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Because usually for the older generation, sometimes uh, why do I uh, uh, meet up with my old friends? Huh? I call them my old friends at least once a year. Yeah, I mean, as we get older, maybe I get more sentimental. I just want to check that they are still alive. <laughs> sometimes Same, it's, even it's, so, it's, I'm it's like, really, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so when you had your uncles and they are not, uh, they're so reluctant to come and see whether uh, uh, their other siblings are doing well, you know, uh, uh, especially when they are in their 60s and 70s and they, they, they just aren't that many Qingming more for them mm. to gather, right? Okay, then, then really the family relationship is, uh, is, has been diluted. Mm. I, when I was young, I went to school here as well, and I, uh, I had some friends who were, who were members of these families, and I was constantly amazed that they were really ordered, even as children, to be to attend these family dinners, mm -hmm. uh, usually around once a week that they have to get together. And I thought at the time, it, how foolish that must be and how, what an imposition it was. But in the long run, you know, like you say, they got to know each other better, and uh, mm -hmm like them or like they knew they knew how they thought and what they were up to so it was a good technique keep your keep your friends close and your enemies closer yes it's even better than your enemies into your friends mm. <laughs> even better <laughs> excellent it, okay yeah. it's it's good it's good to um really consider having a family event um, because like in the past year where, where I still work with my parents and there's a conflict and that I'm trying to retreat myself because to avoid um, some harsh communication and um, my parents that, how would I put this? Like when, when he talked with the employees, the tone of voice is you know hard and loud so sometimes he forget to change his tone of voice when using with um, the children or anything like that so when you hear it, it it's kind of hurt your feeling a little and of course I, I, I try to um, avoid conflict right so he trying to tell me like okay what what should he do and you know so I was telling him like, we cannot just, me and you, we cannot make decisions, just two of us. We have to gather all the family members and to discuss with this, it's a business, it's a family business. So the next day he called like um, other of my siblings like from Australia to fly all the way back to Thailand mm -hmm. just to like, to have, um, you know, family meetings and, um, dinners or anything like that but because that time I still don't know about like um, a formal family meetings that where we make decision on business or anything like that so um, when we meet it's kind of awkward you know when we talk about like okay let's get serious we're going to talk yeah. about this issue and blah 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 so that time it doesn't make out. That's why at this, like today, this year, I'm trying to study more about um, why, why we need this and how can I going to convey them to um, apply these things in the family business. Mm. Yeah, maybe, you know, it's, it's, you know, practice make perfect, right? So mm -hmm. it's always the very first so-called former family meeting that could be a little bit awkward but subsequently you get more used and used to it you know our brain mm -hmm. get conditioned and others get conditioned as well and that is maybe over time you learn how to agree to disagree but if you never even take the initial step to do that then the family would never learn mm. yeah it, it's like um, uh, a stage for all the family members to come to discuss or have a reasonable conflict or conversation in um, a proper prison speech, like not to evolve too much emotions or having a better discussion on the table. 
Mm. Yeah, and sometimes having an independent consultant does help because the independent consultant sets some rules and is very objective mm. rather than a family member set the rules and some other families could say this is completely unfair. Your rules are for yourself, right? So that's why sometimes an independent guy does help. Uh, for example, Mandy go there and said, all right, each branch, all right, one complaint, three minutes, not mm. more than three minutes. Okay, and when they start to quarrel, okay, you, you set the house rules, all right? Okay, mm. you're beyond your three minutes. Okay, so next time we meet, all right, you continue your uh, grievances another three minutes. Okay, and because they pay Mandy and I'm in Lake, all right, they don't want to overrun my time because I'm going to charge them. So mm. make them feel the pain. <laughs> they need to have skin in the game. Okay, <laughs> so they are precise and concise. Okay, don't, they don't quarrel in front of me because it's too expensive. Okay, <laughs> to quarrel in front of me. You force them to have skin in the game for you. You force them. You force them to obey and to be disciplined. Okay, an independent yeah. uh, 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 consultant could help. Mm. At this moment, like when we still, um, when we have like um, lunch or dinner at the dining table, still have we have to still have to tell our parents to put down their phones, mm. and you know, let's talk about us like families. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of the rules that you it has to mm. go into your family constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, just one one final question for me, and then we'll ask each of you to make a, a closing uh, statement if you'd like. Uh, and that is, it, do you ever run into situations where there are differences between what people would think of as family interests and, and business interests that have to be reconciled somehow? And if so, how 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 do you work through those? And uh, Andy, would you like to go first? Uh, I would think so. I mean, the biggest, okay, family interest is business interest, right? Many families prefer bloodline to be their successor, right? So they think that having my son take over as CEO is in the best interest of the family and in the best interest of the business. Okay. All right. This could be wrong because the son could be, well, could be the, uh, could be uninterested and need not be the most suitable and competent. Yeah. Okay. So how to reconcile this? Very often, all right, if you have multiple children, okay, you had to, well, uh, a family education program and a selection program. How do we uh, select a, a, a family leader? How do we groom? Let's talk about grooming, right? So uh, I remember there was one uh, webinar I was asked, how young should we start to groom our children? I said, as young as they understand ABC, all right? For a very simple reason, you want them to be proud of your heritage. When they are three or four year old, they love stories. You start telling them how your forefathers started the business under the difficult condition. It was war, maybe, all right, widespread poverty in Fujian, and they had to come to Thailand, to Singapore, to Malaysia to start the business and all the hardship, but they become the key who and who and respected people. They started the clan and association to help their fellow countrymen. So you made them proud of the heritage already. So as long as they understand stories, you start a family education. And then when they are 16, 17, get them to visit your family business quite often, any award ceremony, all right, employees, a recognition ceremony, you bring your children there. Okay, and when they are a little bit grown after uni, okay, before university, all right, had a certain so called uh, 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 program, all right, uh, show them all the roles possible in the family business, and essentially get them to think about which discipline they want to study in the university. Yeah, and try to link it to the family business. Now, if they are keen to join the family business, have a proper induction and development program for them, rotate them in various units of the family for one to two years or two to three years. And when, they're, and when they are in mid-level position, give them a team to run and tell them you want to go and become a family leader. I give you a business segment or you create a new business segment. You like e-commerce, you like media, you create for me that business segment. All right, show me performance. Within, give me a timeline. Within five years, are you able to bring me a 20% increment in revenue, in earnings whatsoever, some performance metric. But importantly, a timeline. All right, if you're able to do that, then we would move you up to the C level, senior leadership. All right, and that is when we are going to groom you. All right, and we will give you a timeline. All right, when you are likely to become the CEO. Now, even after your, your son, the next gen has become CEO, it doesn't mean that the father, all right, is just going to step out. Very often, the, the father remains as the chairman of the advisory board. You know, the, the, the father remains as an advisor somewhere. Yep. All right. 
all right, to provide advisory and uh, importantly also supervisory can monitoring role. Okay? All right, but that incumbent, the founder had to take a back seat, all right, but still watch maybe from the position of the chairman of the advisory board, oh, yeah, somewhere from there. Okay, so there must be a proper timeline, yeah, a well structured training process. The timeline is important. I've seen families whereby the founders are, uh, uh, they're very afraid to lose control. Okay. All right. So even when they're 70 year old, the son is 50 year old, the son never had any real decision power. Okay. This mm -hmm. is not going to work. Your son is going to be so frustrated. The son is somehow, all right, either going to think of ways to remove you, all right, mm -hmm. the father, okay, so that he can have real power, all right, if the family ties are not strong or the son is going to go do something else. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's my sense, yeah. Mm. I think the key point also is to uh, communicate a lot um, mm, because we, we are also living in the era where family have less children. And of course, um, having a bloodline to take care of the business, maybe not always a choice that you want to do so um, having to understand your maybe son-in-law or daughter-in-law or um, having the professional come in it, it's it's very important to to talk about it and understand that we all have different values and beliefs so it, it need to adjust continuously yeah it's, it's, a, it's very difficult actually to implement that family constitution because mm -hmm. it's a continuous process. It requires a lot of effort. Like you mentioned, right? Getting family to come for regular meeting, that is already <laughs> a huge hurdle. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, may, maybe many family business had that family constitution, but mm. they gave up trying to enforce it. Mm -hmm. mm. So yeah, ha should, should have like a, a lot of family events and each of the events, like one of my friends also suggests, like um, you, you at least you should have like invite to one of the good dining restaurants. So at least they wanted to come and, you know, some rolling um, or any exciting activities that you, you think your the, the rest of the sibling would join. Yeah. Oh, I mean, mm. sure, you know, so that's why you need to have a family event committee and don't mm. just put the older generation like Mandy, okay, Mandy would just suggest a very traditional Chinese dinner, you had the younger generation, they would be like, oh, we had the dinner, but then, yeah, let's watch Formula One, we had our dinner at the Formula One event, something like this, they make it very fanciful, mm. you know, and then it's going to uh, attract uh, uh, the, the younger generation, yeah, so it's about initiating that first step, mm -hmm and then being creative to engage. And, and not threatening, not threatening the older generation, I think. I think yes, the, not threatening the older generation. Mm. And to mm. me, that would be, as an older generation member, I would I'd be always looking over my shoulder and saying, why, why this person, why is this person coming in? Why are they bringing him or her, mm. not somebody else? Mm. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. So you make, make it uh, for the entire family. There's no uh, agenda. There's no uh, individual agenda except the family agenda. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. If you can, if you can convince them of that, you're probably mm -hmm. working a miracle too at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's actually difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I'll ask Weira now if she has, uh, if she would like to say something else or Professor An would like to, to contribute anything. Oh, thank you. I think we are all enjoying the conversation because it's like, wow. yet, you know, it's interesting to know. And, but yet it's so difficult, I would think. Yeah, it's such a subject that is difficult to really start, kickstart the whole conversation and then, of course, the, the implementation. So, yeah, it's uh, tough. Maybe, yes, we definitely need professional like Prof. Mandy to come in. No matter how much, just pay, it's okay because you need to approach <laughs> that subject. <laughs> I, I think that's the way I think a lot of family uh, businesses would, would, would want to take that particular approach. Because I think it's really tough, like hearing from all the conversations, like Kun you, you have been sharing about the family dinners and then flying back from Australia and stuff. Wow, it's, mm. it's already so costly, right? In that sense, then might as well pay a professional. Mm. <laughs> Even though our family is five members, it, it <laughs> takes, 
yeah, huge yeah. time and effort to everyone come together and like join exactly. in one of the activity events or dinner like yes, all at yes. once so totally. like just once a year <laughs> <laughs> really. Really, really really great of you to be able to, to yeah. share like this Thank i know yeah. it must be must be not that easy to do but yes, uh, indeed. from your point of view to to flesh out what mandy is telling us pretty pretty exciting stuff actually i mean i, I didn't expect indeed. to be so be so swayed by it all it's, it's a and it's it's all human nature you know it's not really not just any kind of chinese big family it's like you say small families can be anywhere hmm. having these kind of issues correct correct Excellent. so thank you thank you so much Kunbu. thank you so much prof mandy and of course alex for moderating this session we have definitely learned a lot and of course thank you so much for all of you who have actually stayed on with us for the past two hours listening learning and all the things that we have been you know taking back from from this session itself so uh, please join us. This is the second part of a four-part series. Webinar 3, Webinar 4, they are upcoming in June and July respectively. So please do keep a look out for the EDMs coming through via your mailboxes. Okay? Yeah. So before we end, thank you so much. Please help us with uh, this feedback. Like we always say, feedback is a gift. So your gift will definitely help us to put up more of such contents, useful uh, impactful, beneficial, and practical kind of a contents for all of you here. So let us know what are the other topics you are interested in. We will do best to present it to all of you. Okay. So with that, once again, thank you so much. Um, we will look. We look forward to seeing you next month. All right. Thank. You.